we're time traveling now. Say hello to yourselves in the past. Say hello to yourselves in the future. There we go. Um, eighth grade art. We talked about the camera obscura. Uh, we now have the photographic camera to discuss. We're going to review this slide presentation together. That's what we're doing now. And this week you will be responsible for making sure that the camera on your device is working. Uh, and if not, we're going to get that problem sorted out. Albert, I have been compared to Vsauce for about three years now. He jocked my look a long time ago and I, I let it slide. Like and subscribe. I'm actually wearing a shirt right now that is, uh, this is a Vsauce shirt. I, I get Vsauce swag. Vsauce! My brother signed my son up for his like monthly science kit subscription. So uh, I get to rock the Vsauce swag and he gets to rock the Mr. Z look. All right, so uh, let's take a look. Camera, as it continues to march toward modernity, modernity, which means the modern era. Yes, we, we use lots of big boy and big person words in art class. Uh, terminology is something that means that we can describe something very specific without needing to use even more words, right? So uh, let's look at what cameras became in the 19th through 21st centuries. Uh, the basic principle, right? In the first half of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, a French artist and innovator of photography named Louis Daguerre helped to develop the photographic technology that basically puts a light sensitive material inside a camera obscura so that when the aperture is open and light comes in, the image is captured by the light sensitive material. Then the aperture is closed again and the light sensitive material is removed in a dark place and the image is then transferred to a form that is not light sensitive so that it can be viewed under normal conditions. The daguerreotype was the first kind of photo that Daguerre invented. At first, it took a long time to expose the light sensitive material, which was put on a metal plate inside the camera, um, so that the only things which showed up were the ones that remained still. In other words, it took a while for the chemicals to react. In this image, what we see is a busy street scene outside of Daguerre's window in Paris. So look at this photograph. Do you see all the people walking around everywhere? This image is, this scene would have been full of people walking around like it was Times Square. No, you don't see anyone. Uh, because they're all moving around, the only person who showed up in the image was the guy getting his boot polished. And you can see him standing there with his leg up. Um, I've got an app on my phone called Slow Shutter. And it kind of approximates that same idea. I have it open right now. Um, and watch what happens. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a video of myself here. The part of my face that's standing still is gonna remain, and now I'm moving my hand across. You see me moving my hand? But if I leave the hand up, watch what happens. Okay, so there's the image. My head stayed mainly in one place, but my hand was moving around. So as a result, my hand doesn't show up in the picture. Right? So that's more or less how it worked. So let's review what we know so far about cameras. We know that a pinhole camera is a dark space with a hole in it called an aperture that lets light through to create an image on the inside wall of a space. It's a light trap, basically, right? Uh, a camera obscura is a pinhole camera with a lens in the aperture so that the image can be focused, right? How many of you have ever tried to burn something with a magnifying glass? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun. You try to burn a hole in a piece of paper or something on a, on a sunny day. You have to focus that light using that lens, right? A magnifying glass is a lens 
magnifying lens, they call it. And uh, if we kind of compare it to the image here, let's say instead of the object, it's sunlight, it's coming in, and you see where these crisscross and they come to a point? That's where you're trying to focus that light so that it has the highest amount of intensity, right? All that sunlight is getting condensed into a single point, and that's what gives it heat. It's not distributed over a wider area. So if you go too close to the lens or too far away, uh, that beam crisscrosses and it diffuses. It becomes blurry and you don't get the heat. So that's kind of how focusing works. A basic photographic camera is a camera obscura with a shutter that can open and close the aperture and a plate covered in light sensitive material that can capture the image. Don't burn your house down. Um, over the next hundred or so years, uh, sorry, over the next hundred years or so, the materials that were used to capture images were scientifically evolved by various inventors and engineers. Photographic plates were, gave way to celluloid film and photographers gained the ability to capture images more quickly and in color because of advancements in the chemistry of the light sensitive materials. On the left, we see an old photograph. When do we think that's from? I'm with Addison, I'm, I'm putting this in the 1860s because these gentlemen are wearing Civil War attire, American Civil War attire. Um, and the photograph on the right was shot not too long after that, maybe if a decade or two or three decades later. And that's from Russia. And that is a color photograph. They had color photographs at the time. They were just very rare. It was a very intense, intensive and uh, costly process, but they had color photographs back then. Cameras were becoming less expensive, more portable, and more widely available to the public, but they still relied on the basic rudimentary technology from which they had started. So essentially, we're still talking about a camera obscura or a pinhole camera with a few modifications to it, right? In old-timey movies, for example, you can see how photographers had to duck under a dark hood to keep the light out of the camera during the time the shutter was being opened. You can also see old-timey photographers holding up powerful flash bulbs because the ambient light in a room wasn't bright enough to expose a clear image on the kinds of film they had back then. Just like when I tried my pinhole camera in the room, there isn't enough ambient light in here to really make a good image inside our pinhole camera. So if I open my window, let's see, it's getting kind of sunny outside. You can get enough light outside the room. You're starting to kind of see an image there. What are we looking at? Let's try it this way. Oops, where's the hole? Hmm, yeah, still kind of dark. And mainly what you're seeing is uh, the image of, of the light coming through the cracks in the camera. But it is an image that, that, that is light coming through and hitting the surface. It's, you're not looking at a hole. I want to give you some photography vocabulary, and this is going to be important as we continue with the photography unit so that you know what you know we're talking about. Uh, we have aperture. An aperture, of course, is what? Yeah, it's the hole. It's the hole that lets the light in. Um, the light travels into the camera through the aperture. You can adjust the size of your aperture on most cameras uh, by a device called an iris, which we also associate with our eyeballs. By the way, the, the, your irises open and close around a hole that's called a pupil. And the type of muscle that your uh, iris is, is actually a sphincter muscle. So it's the same kind of muscle that open and opens and closes your stomach, like the, the closure between your stomach and your intestines, uh, the, the, the muscle that opens and closes your butt when you're pooping, same muscle as in your eyeball. So I want you to think about that next time you read a, a beautiful piece of poetry about gazing into somebody's eyes, gazing into their sphincters to create a larger or smaller aperture. And uh, yeah, thank you, you're welcome. You're welcome, Janice. 
Depth of field, that is the, the range of distances from the camera at which parts of the image are in focus or blurry. Blurriness within the depth of field can be adjusted by focusing the camera lens or by opening and closing the aperture. And that's why the, the, the different sizes of your aperture are called F stops. F stands for focal range. So uh, your focal range has to do with uh, how far away from the camera something will appear in focus. And that is your depth of field. Your depth of field is the beginning and end of your focal range, okay? Um, and focusing basically means you're spacing the lenses inside the camera so that they produce a sharp, clear image, just like when we focus that magnifying glass when we're trying to start a little fire, right? Uh, you're trying to get the, the light to form a point and not crisscross or, you know, form a trapezoid. Um, focus is typically adjusted using a focused ring, which spirals the lenses together or apart or further or closer uh, to the, uh, the photographic plate or sensor or whatever is capturing the image inside your camera. Um, and in digital cameras, this happens non-mechanically, right? There are no moving parts inside the camera on my cell phone. But what happens is it sees that whole image that it makes and it says, okay, we're gonna enhance this part. And if you close one eye and bring your finger towards your eye, what's gonna happen is you're gonna see your finger in sharp focus and everything beyond it, you're not really gonna get a good sense of uh, of, of detail there, right? And look what my single monocular digital camera is doing. I'm in sharp focus and now my finger is blurry. What's with that? So at a certain point my finger becomes in focus and now everything's in focus and that's because this camera has a very deep depth of field. Everything from about six inches in front of it to infinity is sharp in focus. It doesn't know how to focus on a specific uh, depth of field. The frame, when I say the frame, that is, these are the outlines of our image. Remember, um, lenses are circular, right? Look at this one, circular lens. Whoops, there it is, circular lens. So how can we see a rectangular image? That's because uh, most cameras crop images into the rectangles that we're familiar with. That lets them have corners and we can put frames around them and stuff like that. That's right. They, they inscribe a rectangle into that circle. Within this frame, there's all sorts of compositional rules like the rule of thirds, which basically says that a composition is more interesting if you make it slightly asymmetrical. What does asymmetrical mean? Not symmetrical, so what does symmetrical mean? It's not the same how on both sides, right? Symmetry implies sameness across a line or a point or in some direction. You can have many different kinds of symmetry. If we look at the image on the right here, it, uh, the sky, that, that image of the stars rotating around a uh, point to the north, presumably, uh, has what we call radial symmetry. Uh, if you look at something like a swastika or the flag of the Isle of Man, that is a little island in the Irish Sea, you have a very interesting flag and it has radial symmetry. It revolves around a point and that's radial symmetry. So it's not the same across a line like we think of like a Rorschach drawing, you know, like one of those butterflies you make by folding the paper full of paint. So it's that, that's, that's a linear symmetry right across a single line. And you can have symmetry across more lines and you can also have symmetry that rotates and you can have a radial symmetry that does this. Um, the image, of course, we know what that is. That is the picture formed by the light that enters the camera through the aperture. The shutter is the device that opens and closes the aperture so that the photographic medium, that is the light sensitive material, can be exposed to the light coming in and create the image. 
In modern cameras, going back 100, 120 years, the shutter speed can be controlled with a timing mechanism, meaning the photographer can control exactly how long the shutter stays open for, and therefore the length of time that the film or whatever photographic medium is exposed for. The longer the shutter is open, the more light is permitted to enter the camera and the brighter the exposure is. Sometimes uh, longer shutter speeds mean that the exposure will be blurry or not show up at all because of things moving while the shutter is open, like in the daguerreotype, right? And also larger apertures will lead to brighter exposures than uh, smaller apertures, right? Here's that diagram again. See if you can understand it using the vocabulary from the two previous slides. This should start to make more sense now that we understand what all these parts are, right? And what you're seeing here, this image is basically how all cameras work with a few exceptions that are very, very recent, technologically speaking. So um, your digital camera, if you have a digital SLR camera, right? Like any Nikon with a D at the beginning, Instead of having a, a roll of film that rotates here, you have a sensor, a digital sensor, which is kind of like an artificial retina. And cameras work a lot like eyes, right? There's a, there's a matrix of points. Each one is photosensitive, light sensitive, and each uh, point sends a signal to a computer that puts it all together. It says, hey, I've got a one. Hey, I've got a zero. Hey, I've got a one. Hey, I've got a zero. And all those zeros and ones get put together. And they're like, well, what do we do with all this information? They get put together and we get an image just like this one right here. Yeah, so uh, film would come in rolls, sort of like a roll of tape, where like you'd have your image go onto that piece. And then you take a photo. Okay, it's right here. And now we roll it out a little bit more and now you take another photo and it's here and you roll it out a little bit more and now it's here. And then you've got one, two, three images in a row, roll of film. Okay, makes sense? Any questions so far? Lucky you guys, you have an assignment. Check this out. Um, let's look at this together. And let's talk about photo framing. This is a, a basic composition exercise. I'm gonna ask you to take a couple photographs, I'm gonna show you how. The first photograph is gonna concentrate on light and shadow. Photography is an art form that engages very directly with light, since a camera is essentially a way of trapping and controlling light, right? Any disagreements there? No? Good, let's continue. Your first, your first photography composition will involve looking around for a place where light is creating two different colors where the surface is actually only one color. What do I mean by that? I'll show you. Here's uh, this corner of the classroom back here. See that? Look at that. That's, that's what I'm talking about right there. Um, the light, which is coming through the windows, is causing the wall to appear two different colors because part of the wall that's not directly facing the light coming in through the windows is partially in shadow, right? How many different colors do you see on this wall? Talking about the wall itself, not all the cartoons that I pasted on it. Two colors, right? How many different colors do you think they used when they painted the wall? One. So how does that work? As we move closer, we can start to see the photo frame divided evenly in two. The red rectangle is approximately how I want to frame my photograph, right? Exactly. Uh, we're seeing two different colors because of light and shadow. So for that first assignment, what I want you to do is to create a composition with a highlight and a shadow of a single color, dividing the frame into two parts. Okay? Uh, not They don't have to be equal sizes, but basically we're looking for, uh, it's gonna be like an abstract composition that looks like uh, two different colors, but it's actually one color and that's because of how light is hitting that surface. And then of course, bouncing back into your camera. Uh, next, let's talk about color. Since we're gonna be working in color, it's important to understand some basics. For those of you who didn't study color theory with me or at all last year, here's a quick recap. 
This is the color wheel. The colors on this version, which I found online, are not super accurate. So I, uh, I put in little bubbles with more accurate hues and abbreviated color titles. But it gives you a good idea of the relationships between the colors. You can kind of see where they are on that color wheel, right? So, um, yeah. What's really important are the color relationships shown here. See that red rectangle? Those are the ones that I'm interested in. Analogous colors are any colors that appear side by side or next to each other in the color wheel. So they're showing yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, orange, but it can also be red, violet, violet, and blue, violet. Those are all analogous colors to each other. Blue, green, and green are analogous colors, right? Because they appear next to each other in that color wheel. Complementary colors appear as diametric opposites on the color wheel. So yellow, orange, and blue, violet are diametrically opposite. They are across the diameter of that circle. Red, orange, and blue, green, diametrically opposite. Yellow and violet, diametrically opposite. And split complementary are a type of triadic color relationship, which form any kind of symmetrical triangle across the color wheel. Symmetrical triangle. So not any three random colors, but any three colors that form a triangle that has a line of symmetry to it. So either uh, an isosceles or an equilateral triangle, but not a scalene triangle. Have you guys learned about that in geometry? Different triangle types. I think I have triangles on my shirt. Again, Vsauce. My shirt's upside down so that I can read it. So what I, what I want you to do is to find or set up a color relationship to photograph. This beverage container over on my uh, chalkboard over there was a uh, complementary color relationship because red and the green of the chalkboard uh, are directly opposite each other on the color wheel. So uh, I took a photo of it and I used the rule of thirds. Before you take your photograph, put some careful thought into its composition. The rule of thirds is a guide to creating aesthetically pleasing compositions by introducing asymmetry. To use it, try to center or line up the elements of your composition with the one third of the width or height of your frame. You can be very creative within these guidelines. And by the way, whenever you are given compositional rules like the rule of thirds, those rules are there to be broken. I want you to see how you can experiment with different compositions to try to get something that is maximally interesting. Although I do ask you to try to experiment with the rule of thirds for this assignment. Uh, so here's the overview. Photo number one, light and shadow, create a simple composition with a highlight and a shadow of a single color dividing the frame into two parts. Photo number two, colors and thirds, create a simple composition with an analogous complementary or split complementary color relationship using the rule of thirds as a basis for your composition. You do not have to adhere to it strictly, but maybe as a starting point. This is where you're starting from. That's where you're going. That's it. Let's take a look at the rubric just so you understand why you only got 20 points on this, which is the maximum number of points. That means you did a really good job. You got 10 of those points because you created a single composition with a highlight and a shadow of a single color dividing the frame into two parts. And you created a simple composition with an analogous complementary or split complementary color relationship using the rule of thirds. And then you got another 10 points just because it looks like you were careful in the way that you composed your photograph, right? Uh, that's what's up.